He said, where two or three are gathered in my name, I will be there. So this morning, he is here. And I hope that each one of you have already connected and that you're sensing his presence in your life. I hope you're not sitting there and it's just passed you by because the glory of God is here. You just need to reach out by faith. Take it in and just enjoy it and rejoice in the Lord. He inhabits the praises of his people. And as we just bear down in praise and lift up that sacrifice of praise, uh, oh, he enjoys being there and being in our midst. And uh, we want him here. <laughs> My goodness, we want him here. We need him here. I don't want to be here if he's not. So uh, good to see all of you here. I hope you came with expectation. Because as you come with expectation, God will meet you. And so today, we're looking forward to the last chapter of the book of the Revelation, the revealing. So turn to the very last book in the Bible, the last chapter, chapter 22. And we're talking about heaven and his coming. And so there are so many wonderful truths out of this passage <clears throat> that I really want to... Uh, I really want us to focus on. I'm going to read down through the first seven verses. So if you have your Bibles or your electronic Bible or whatever you have there, open it up. There is a Bible in the pew rack in front of you if you don't have one. <clears throat> Revelation 22 and verse 1. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb. Through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with, it, with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Verse 3, No longer will there be any more cursed things. But the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Verse 6, and he said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. And verse 7 says, and behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Well, we've been looking at heaven. We've been looking at this great city called the New Jerusalem. Heaven is a kind of a generic term because we see that heaven really, technically, doesn't really fulfill itself until we get to the new heaven, new earth, and the new Jerusalem comes and sits down on that at the end of all things, and the eternal state begins. That is what we call heaven. But we use the term in a generic sense to refer to um, even today. We say, well, he's gone to heaven or she's gone to heaven. And what we mean is that they have gone to be with the Lord, and the Lord is in this wonderful city, the New Jerusalem. You see, that's a promise that was given even in the Old Testament. You'll remember in Hebrews chapter 11, it talks about Abraham. Abraham, it says, he looked for a city. A city. He was looking for the New Jerusalem, a city whose builder and architect was God. So he was looking for a heavenly city all of his life. Now, Abraham, when he died, he really didn't go to heaven. Now, I know that's blowing your mind, but just think about it. <clears throat> Where did he go? Well, the Bible tells us that prior to 
Christ coming uh, in his death, burial, and resurrection, thank you, that whenever there was a saint who died, they went to a place that the Bible refers to as Hades. Now, normally we think of Hades as being a very negative term. And yet, according to the Scripture, Hades, or as it's referred to in the Hebrew, Sheol, was a place that people went when they died. On one side, according to Luke 16, there was paradise. Abraham's bosom, as it's called. You remember when Jesus was dying and the thief on the cross said, remember me when you come into your kingdom? What did Jesus tell him? He said, today you'll be with me where? He didn't say, today you'll be with me in heaven. He said, today you will be with me in paradise, Abraham's bosom. In other words, Hades. And so it was that the saints of the Old Testament, when they died, they went into paradise. But there was a great gulf, according to Luke 16, that separated Hades into two parts. And on the other side was a place of torment and a place of flame. You get that very clearly when you read the story, and I believe it is a true story, not a parable, of Jesus talking about the rich man and Lazarus. And so we find that heaven was really kind of unoccupied, as it were, until Jesus, according to Ephesians, he, when he died, the Bible says that before he ascended, he first descended. You see the thief on the cross? You will be with me today in paradise. So, it was always believed and taught that paradise, or Hades, was in the center of the earth somewhere. And so, Jesus, when he died, he went to paradise. Now, what did he do in paradise? Well, the Bible says he proclaimed a message. And what was that message? He says, all of you who have looked forward to your redemption, today's your day. You were, as it were, and I've explained this before, you were kind of saved on credit. Your faith caused you to give sacrifice to try to cover your sin. And your sin was covered, but it wasn't taken away. But when Christ died on the cross and he paid for the sin debt, it's like all of their debt that had been covered was now finally paid. And so here they were rejoicing when Christ came and proclaimed to them, today's the day of redemption for you. Today is the day when it is paid for. And of course, on the other side, those who had rejected God, they heard that message too. But for them, it was not a message of hope. It was a message of finality. But for the saints that Jesus came to, it was the day they had longed for. You see, Abraham did not enter into the promises. He saw them afar. He rejoiced when he saw them. See, Jesus said, Abraham, he saw my day and he rejoiced. But he didn't get to experience the promises until the day when Christ descended after he died on the cross. And then the Bible says he led captivity. So in a sense, paradise was a place of captivity in the sense that they were, had to stay there. They were there. He led captivity what? Captive, the scripture says. And so he who ascended first descended, leading captivity captive as it was prophesied, it says in Ephesians. And then he took the souls of saints up to that time and he took them on a glorious procession. I'll get it out there in a minute. Sometimes your tongue gets wrapped around your eye teeth and you can't see where you're going. 
And in that glorious procession, they went into heaven, and Jesus presented his blood in the heavenly temple, heavenly tabernacle. You see, Moses saw the pattern of this when he was on the mount, and he made the earthly after the pattern of the heavenly. And Jesus presented his blood, and the law said, I'm satisfied. God said, it is finished, because Christ had said that on the cross. Wonderful, wonderful. And so on that day, can you imagine entering in the new Jerusalem? Abraham was actually able to walk into the city that he saw by faith. The city he had been looking for, whose builder and maker was God. He was able to experience that. Now today, all saints, since Christ, those who have put their faith and trust in him, now when we die... The Bible says, absent from the body is to be what? Present with the Lord. Well, where is the Lord? He ascended. The scripture says here that we read this morning that he was what? Seated at the right hand of the Father. And so he's in heaven. Or what we would technically call the new Jerusalem. That glorious city that Abraham looked for. And there they are rejoicing. And there... Our loved ones are rejoicing. Now, one of these days, all of the saints that are in this massive city, we talked about how big it was last time, massive. It's going to come and sit down on the totally purified new heaven and earth. And so when it comes and sits down, after, as Peter says, after it has been really cleansed by fire, fervent heat, All things are made new. The city comes down and sits on this new earth. And that begins the eternal state. The judgments are over. Satan is cast into the lake of fire. By the way, I'm going to tweak your mind a little bit more here. Just as, (laughs) in a technical sense, no one is in the new heaven and new earth yet because it hasn't come into being and so just as in the old testament no one went to heaven so hang on there's nobody in hell today oh wait a minute ah preacher you just fell off the deep end no think about it remember what i said people when they died they went where hades hades had according to jesus's teaching two parts One side was paradise, one side was called a place of torment. You remember the rich man, he said to Abraham, he said, Abraham, would you send Lazarus, the guy that was sitting at my gate begging that I despised, would you send this man just to dip his finger in water and touch my tongue? For I am tormented in this flame. Now, In a generic sense, it's okay to use the word hell. But in a technical sense, hell is the lake of fire. Nobody is in the lake of fire today, but they are in flame and torment today. And they have been since the beginning. One day, the Bible says, here in Revelation, we're going to read it, and we have read it in chapter 20, Death and Hades are delivered up to the great white throne. Remember, we went over that. And there, everyone is judged according to their works. And it says, death and Hades are cast into the what? Lake of fire. The lake of fire is technically what we refer to as hell. So what happens today? People go to the place of torment today who have rejected Christ. Those who have decided to live their life their own way without God and they don't want God, they've rejected God's love. God has given them their own way. They go there 
And they wait all through the millennium until the great white throne at the end of the millennium. And then all the dead, great and small, John says, were delivered up out of Hades, judged, and then in the lake of fire. So in a technical, now again, technical sense, no one is in hell today because hell is the lake of fire. Today, people are in torment and flame. But they will be delivered up later. Now you're saying, and I needed to know this, why? (laughs) Just simply because it's truth. So that you understand what the Bible is really saying. You know, a lot of times people say stuff, and they say, well, the Bible teaches this, and the Bible teaches that, and I'm sitting there saying, "Eh, no, it doesn't. But you have to be careful because you don't want to hurt people's feelings. But sometimes, you know, I'm sitting there thinking, well, God helps those who help themselves, the Bible says. "Eh, No, it doesn't. You know, and people are all the time throwing out stuff that they say the Bible teaches. But folks, the Bible says, study to show yourself, tell me, approved a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, but rightly divides the word, the word of truth. Right. So, what are we talking about? We're talking about heaven today. The real heaven. The new Jerusalem is part of heaven But the new Jerusalem sits down on the new heaven and the new earth that God has purified. And when it sets down like a satellite upon this new earth, that is what we technically refer to as the eternal state, or more properly, that is heaven proper for eternity. Okay? Now, If you go out of here and say the preacher at First Baptist Church says nobody's in hell today, I hope you'll go ahead and explain that. Because if you're not going to explain it, don't say it. Okay. I remember I was listening to Dr. Warren Wiersbe go through this years and years ago, and he said that, and I mean all of us, we set up and, okay, Doc, you got our attention. And he went through through the explanation. And of course, as he went through, he said, yeah, 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 yeah. And you start connecting all the verses. Yeah, that's why it makes sense now. Okay. But here's what I want to say. Heaven is real. Hell is... No one takes any delight in talking about hell. We all (laughs) rejoice in talking about heaven. Well, we've been talking about heaven. We talked about its size last time. We talked about the gates of pearl. Each gate was a pearl. Three on the north, three on the south, three on the east, and three on the west. And we said that there were the names of the 12 tribes on each of those 12 gates. There was an angel at each gate. And then we talked about the foundations that the new Jerusalem set on. And each one of them was made of a gemstone. There was diamond foundation, there was a ruby foundation, there was a sapphire foundation, there was an emerald foundation. I mean, you think about how massive this city is, and then you think about rubies and diamonds that many. I don't know, I think if you need rubies and diamonds in your mansion, just probably pull out a drawer and there's a whole handful of them in there, you just scoop them up. You see, we get so caught up in stuff And heaven, well, it is so completely filled with everything that we think is valuable. And God says the real value of heaven is me. You see, for me, being in heaven is not about gold streets. I mean, that's great. That's great. I'm, I am so glad. I guess God is just telling me that, you know, what we value so much down here, they use for pavement up there. You know, it's just... But the thing that 
thrills me the most is I get to see the one who died for me. I get to embrace and be embraced by him. I get to look in his eyes. I get to hear him speak my name. I get to see the smile on his face. I get to hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of thy Lord. We've been looking forward to your coming. Now that's what makes me want to dance. I'm not the, the pearl, the diamonds. Yeah, that's great, wonderful. And if you've never had a whole lot of that, it doesn't, doesn't really matter a lot. It's just God's way of saying what man thinks is most precious. I use it for building material. But what's most precious is the one who gave his life for me. And notice what it says, that God's throne is in the new Jerusalem, in this city. And in the throne room of God, which is a massive throne room, I mean, it is so massive. And there is the crystal sea out in front of his throne that we talked about. This massive diamond arena in front of his throne. And out of the throne, and the throne is massive, and he and the Lamb, or Jesus, are sitting there on that throne. And from that throne, the headwaters flow what is called the water of life, the river of life. And the Bible says it shines. It looks like crystal. Oh, and it's so refreshing. And I kind of think, well, we've got God the Father, God the Son, where's the Holy Spirit? I think the river of life flowing kind of speaks to me of the Holy Spirit. Flowing. And so what does it say? It says that in the middle of Main Street, now, every city has a main street, I guess. The New Jerusalem has a main street. Huge main street. And the Bible says it's like a boulevard because right in the middle, down the middle of main street, flows this water of life. This refreshing, crystal clear water of life. Wow. And it flows throughout the entire length of the New Jerusalem. And flows down upon the new earth. What a, what a tremendous, tremendous sight that's going to be. Refreshing. And then it says something even more astounding. Not only that, but on either side of the river that flows down on Main Street, and of course there's, I don't know, traffic going both ways, I would imagine. And this tremendous river says on either side of the river, there is the tree of life. Now, where was the last time we saw the tree of life in Scripture? Remember? Genesis 3. And you remember, after the fall, God said, we can't leave them in the garden, and now that they've eaten the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they eat the tree of life. They don't need to live in fallen bodies for the eternity. They need to live in redeemed bodies. And so the Bible implies that the tree of life was removed. Well, where was it taken to? Well, the next time we see it, we see it in the New Jerusalem. And it is an amazing tree. It must be huge because it spans on either side of the river, kind of like a banyan tree. You know, it has roots that go both sides. Some say, well, maybe linguistically what it refers to is tree-lined, that there are numerous trees of life. The only problem with that is, is that in the Old Testament, it's spoken of as singular. In the passage here, it's spoken of as singular. Now, it also says that this tree of life produces fruit. And it has 12 manner of fruit, one for each month. Now somebody says, well, wait a minute. Um, I thought there was no time in heaven. Well, time does not affect us in heaven like it affects us down here. But there is at least some kind of a measurement because it says one fruit for each month. So every month there's a different fruit. 
Some think it means that all 12 fruit are, are on one tree all the time, but I don't gather that. I gather that it goes through cycles. And the Bible says also that its leaves were for the healing of the nations. Now, I take this to mean that before the new heaven and the new earth are made, that on the millennial earth where nations and people are living, before the end of the millennium, that whole thousand year period, the new Jerusalem kind of acts as a satellite that the redeemed saints can go back and forth to. And that the tree of life, which is up there, that the leaves are brought down for healing purposes. Because there will be people in unredeemed bodies that are born during the millennial kingdom, and so this is why they're going to live for a long time, plus the fact the curse is removed. But in heaven, it says there is no longer anything in verse 3 that is accursed. What is, re, what is part of the curse? Well, we can, we can name a lot of things. We know that there is so much that has come with the curse when man fell, death being the biggest one. Disease, heartache, labor and childbirth. There is also the matter of the earth being cursed so that when you want to harvest, you have to fight all the pestilence, you have to fight the thorns, you have to fight everything in order to get the harvest in. But on the new heaven and the new earth, the curse is banished. No more death, no more crying, no more sickness, no more pain and sorrow, no curse of any kind will be in this new Jerusalem. Wow. What an exciting thing it will be. And it says, and his servants will worship him. That's going to be a big part of heaven, is worshiping the Lord. And we're having worship. Can you imagine what a worship service in heaven would look like? I don't know. Now, we're going to have communion this morning at the end of the service. Do you know there's going to be communion in heaven? You say, really? Why? Why? Remember what Jesus told his disciples the night he was betrayed? You know, when they were in the upper room and before they went out to the garden? What did he say? I will eat or drink of the fruit of the vine no more until when? Until I come together with you in my kingdom. So we know that in the Jerusalem when the saints are gathered, part of the worship service will be remembering the sacrifice of our Lord. Why? Because that's why we're there. That's how we got there. And we're so excited to be there. How many think you're going to be excited to be there? Thank you, are? Yeah. Amen. We're going to be excited. And can you imagine the Lord himself leading a communion service in remembrance of me? Hmm. Did you know, and I've said this before, the only man-made thing in heaven are the scars on Jesus' hands and feet and side. It's the only man-made things in heaven. And we will see those scars throughout all eternity, reminding us of how we were able to get to heaven to start with. Certainly not on our own good works. Notice it says also, let's continue. This is so much here, I'm going to have to speed it up. Verse 24, this, verse 4, it's as exciting. And they will see his what? Face. What will it be like when you see the face of Jesus for the first time? I can't imagine. I can't even come to grips with what I will feel or what I will do. I haven't tried to sit down and figure out now when I see him I'm going to do this and I'm going to say this and I want to I got a feeling when I see him I'm just probably 
blubber. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I'm just going to shut up and let him do all the talking. You know, if I could get out three words and say, I love you, boy, I'd be doing really good. It says, they shall see his face and his names will be in their foreheads. Well, this could be literally or symbolically. Symbolically in the sense that we know who we belong to. Literally in the sense that, you know, our crown will have his name etched on it and we wear it. <laughs> and so he's everywhere you go. You see, there's precedent for that because in the Old Testament, the high priest wore a crown, mitre kind of a thing, and had a band and etched on that band was the name of the Lord. And it said, holiness to the Lord. So we kind of have some kind of an idea, precedent for that happening too. They shall see his face, his name will be on their foreheads, verse 5, and night will be no more. We associate a lot of evil with night, don't we? When it gets dark, it seems like evil wants to play. Seems to be the time when evil gathers its strength at night. But here there will be no night. There will not be lamps. When you get into your new dwelling place in heaven, you're not going to go around turning on lights. There's no power plant in heaven. Why? Because the glory of God shines throughout the city. And when you've got the city that is transparent in so many ways and the light just shines everywhere and no shadows, you don't need artificial light because the glory of God lights every nook and cranny. And the Bible says we're children of the light and the light dwells in us, so um, we're not going to be in darkness. And it says that we will reign with him forever and ever. I like the fact that it double emphasizes the forever. Forever, and then just for emphasis, and forever. Double emphasis. It means, yeah, forever means forever. No end. Absolutely no end. And we will reign. The idea of reigning has to do with function. You see, heaven is not going to be a place where we can just get lazy, do nothing. There will be function on the new heaven and the new earth for eternity. You see, even Adam and Eve had function in the garden before sin. And so, in a sense, paradise lost in Genesis is paradise regained in Revelation. And so we will have function. Verse 6, and he said these words are trustworthy and true. Folks, he's not making it up. This is not a fairy tale. This is something that is real as the person next to you is real. Just as real. Sometimes people hear stories of heaven. They hear stories of angels. They hear stories like streets of gold, and they think it is all just some kind of a big, made-up fairy tale to help us deal with the unknown thing called death. But John says, Jesus said, this is true. This is true. Jesus is God. He cannot lie. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, in other words, the prophets, true prophets, are speaking by the Spirit of God, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. And so John is one of his servants. The angel is revealing all these things which must soon take place. Now, the word soon here is a relative term. It means that in relationship to eternity, it is soon. In relationship to the end of all things, it is soon. That we've come to the final age of grace and we're living in that end time. And his coming could be soon. We're going to find out later that when he says that my coming, 
I will come soon, that the Greek word for that really should more effectively be translated suddenly. Watch, for I am coming suddenly. Suddenly is a better way to understand that. Well, John in verse 8 and 9 gets so overwhelmed that he literally falls down and starts worshiping this magnificent, glorious angel. Now, he did this back in chapter 19, and he got rebuked for it. And the angel back in chapter 19 said, now, don't do that. You and I are servants. We're fellow servants. We both serve the Lord, so don't worship me. I'm just an angel. I'm just a servant. Well, John gets so overwhelmed with what he's seeing about heaven, he just can't stand it, and he falls down and <laughs> he worships the angel. says, dude, I told you once, don't do that. Get up. Verse 9, he says, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and with those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. And that's why we come together, is to worship God. Anytime we get our eyes off God and get it on man, I don't care how charismatic that man may be, I don't know how, matter how, it doesn't matter how great he may be or spirit-filled or anything else, we worship God. And if a man is spirit-filled, he will point you to God, not to himself. He won't be drawing attention to himself. Now notice what he says in verse 10. And he said to me, do not seal up the words of this prophecy of this book at this time. Now you remember that when Daniel was given a prophecy concerning end time events, and he was writing it all down, and the Lord said to Daniel, you can't release that. Don't let that out. Seal it up. Because it is not time for this revelation to be given. And so Daniel, I don't know whether he just scratched it out, wadded it up, I don't know, but he did not release the things that the Lord told him. Now, I believe what God told Daniel, I believe he told John in the book of the Revelation. And this time, God says to John, don't seal it up, release it. Because we are in the age where this needs to be understood. This needs to be known, for this is coming. And so, verse 11, he says, Let the evildoer still do evil, let the filthy still be filthy, let the righteous still do right, and let the holy still be holy. Why does he say that? Because in the previous verse, when he talked about the events that are coming, he said they are near. They are going to come quickly. And he says it's going to come so quickly that the evil ones are not going to have time to repent. And the righteous ones who are doing righteous, they won't have time to do more righteousness. It's going to happen, boom. Paul said in Corinthians, he said it'll appear, his coming will be what? In the twinkling of an eye. And there's going to be people not ready in that moment because for whatever reason, they have put off, put off, put off, put off. And they put it off so long and their heart has gotten harder and harder and harder and harder. And they will be left behind. Sad, but true. Especially when it's so unnecessary. So unnecessary. Then notice what he says here. Verse 12. Behold, I am coming suddenly, and I will bring my reward or recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. You know, when I would go overseas, and I'd be gone for a while, maybe sometimes three weeks or so at a time, when I came home, I always brought gifts. I brought gifts from... Korea, or I'd bring gifts from the Philippines. And I can remember when I was in Itawan in Korea, where the 8th Army headquarters was, that Itawan back in the days before the Korean Olympics there, 
it was the best place in the world to shop. And I remember getting a cashmere top coat and suit and all that kind of stuff, standing out on a box in front of L.A. Town's custom suit store. And they measured me. They had three or four guys. They were just writing down stuff. Next day, I got beautiful suit, everything tailor-made, sports coat, cashmere. And man, I had so much stuff. I was, bought Marilyn all of these eel skin purses, and I bought my kids all of these tennis shoes, and, and I bought them all kinds of other stuff. And I had stuff here, and I couldn't get it all in my suitcase. So I had to go find a guy down the street, sold suitcases. Now, whatever you need, they got it. And I bought a suitcase that was, and it had wheels, all kinds of wheels. It looked like an 18-wheeler, you know? I opened it up, and I just kept, it was so cheap. I just kept pouring it in there. Zipped that sucker up, got it on the plane, and uh, brought it home. When I came home, and I pulled that thing in the house, and we all greeted each other, and I opened it up. Oh, man, it was just Christmas in July. You know, I mean, it was just a wonderful experience. Listen, when Jesus comes, he's been away a while, but when he comes, he said, I'm going to be bringing my gifts with me. I'm going to be giving out gifts when I see you. <laughs> and of course, that's all wonderful, but just seeing him is the greatest gift in the world. But he says, I will bring my reward with me. Verse 13, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning of the end. This is a title that is used of God the Father. It is also a title that is used of God the Son. It proves the deity of Christ. Alpha and Omega, everything. He is our beginning, He is our middle, He is our end, He's our all in all, everything we need. And uh, He says in verse 14, Blessed are those who wash their robes. Now, how do you wash your robes? First of all, I don't even own a robe. This is metaphorical. Robe is what you cover yourself with. You're either going to cover yourself in your own works, your own self-righteousness, which will not be acceptable when you stand before God, or you will have robes that have been washed. Because Jeremiah says all of our robes are like filthy rags. In other words, all of our self-effort to save ourselves. But when we stand before the Lord, we have been washed. How do I wash my robes? It's called repentance. When I repent, turn to Christ, I ask Him to be my righteousness because I have none. That's what the Bible metaphorically refers to as washing your robes. We sing that song, Are you washed in the what? Are you washed in the blood? And then, of course, he says, those who have been redeemed, saved, they, get it. they have the privilege of eating of the tree of life. But those who have not, those who are on the outside and practice all of this stuff he mentions in verse 15, they don't have that privilege. They could have had it, but they chose not to. Maybe their pride got in the way. I don't know. Maybe they said no so long they couldn't say yes. But whatever, they will regret that decision for all eternity. Verse 16 says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. He says, for I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. Now notice this, root and descendant. He said, I'm the creator of David, but I'm also David's descendant. I'm the root, and I'm the descendant. He is both. He's the creator of David, but he's also the, what? Descendant of David. He's called of the lineage of David. And then verse 17 and by the way, bright morning star, this is a messianic title. It refers to the dawning of the new day when the bright morning star, which is usually thought of as being the planet Venus, which is so bright. In other words, I am the one who brings forth the new day, the new dawn. 
Verse 17, and the spirit and the bride say, come. Here's the last invitation of the Bible. This is the last invitation. A lot of times we give invitations. Most Sundays I give an invitation. Why? Because I figure God's been working on hearts and people need to respond. Jesus gave invitations. Invitations were given all through the Scripture. Here's the last invitation. Who gives this invitation? Well, it says here that the Spirit and the Bride say, come. The Spirit is the Holy Spirit. Listen, folks, you never come to God unless the Holy Spirit convicts you and draws you. That is a work of the Spirit of the living God. And it says the bride says, says come. Who's the bride? The church. What are we supposed to be doing? Evangelizing. Telling people what? Come. Giving an invitation is biblical, folks. Biblical. Nothing wrong with it. So when the Holy Spirit is drawing, Christians, the bride, are telling people, come, come to Christ. If you don't have a burden for the lost, I wonder if you have the Spirit of God in you. Because the Spirit of God has a burden for the lost. Notice, it goes on to say here, the invitation says, come. And let the one who hears, come. And let the one who is thirsty, come. Let the one who desires to take of the water of life without price, Did you know that salvation is a free gift? That doesn't mean salvation is cheap. It means it's free. It costs God everything. For God so loved that He gave His only, unique, one and only Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not have to perish. Let them come without price. That means anybody, the richest, the poorest, anyone, any color, any educational background, any cultural background, anyone can come. Verse 18, And I warn everyone who hears the words of this prophecy, This book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away the words from this book in this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and the holy city, which are described in this book. God says, when you mess with my word, I take that seriously. Why? Because my word is truth. And I hear... From time to time, someone will say, well, it doesn't mean it, doesn't mean that, doesn't, you know, and you need to, and after a while, you lose confidence in the Bible because you've heard so many attacks upon it. And God says, don't do that. If you take away, your name will be taken away. If you add to, the plagues will be added to you. Boom. I think God means that. Now verse 20. He who testifies of these things, speaking of Jesus, says, surely I am coming soon. Amen. Now I like that he brackets this. Surely, amen. He's about to make a great statement. Surely. In other words, it is going to happen. I am coming suddenly. A lot of people say, well, that, if it means soon, it's been 2,000 years. That's not soon in my book. That's why I say the word there is suddenly. We don't know when. That's why Jesus says, watch, watch. For in an hour you think not the Son of Man coming. He says, surely I am coming soon. And then we have the last prayer of the Bible. We've seen the last, What? There's several last here. We've seen the last warning, the last invitation. We're looking at the last prayer. Come, Lord Jesus. How many of you have ever prayed that prayer? 
Well, I know I have. Sometimes I look at the mess on TV and the news and all the craziness and how people are calling evil good and calling good evil. And Jesus told us, I mean, Scripture told us that's going to characterize the last days. And then he says what? Lord, come quickly. And that's what I say. Lord, come. If you don't come, Lord, we're really messing it up down here. And then the last verse, and then we close. This is the last blessing of the Bible. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Isn't it amazing that the last blessing is a blessing about grace? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. God is still in this day extending grace, grace. Hope you have availed yourself of that marvelous grace. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you for our study in the book of the Revelation. It's been a great time. It's been a wonderful time. Lord, as we prepare our hearts for communion to partake of these elements that represent the death, burial, and resurrection, the suffering of our Savior, what he suffered for us. Lord, may we have our hearts prepared with thanksgiving and praise as we partake. May we examine our hearts, confess our sin, and receive with thanksgiving. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand, if we would, please. Everybody standing. Just before the folks come to partake of the communion, I'd like for us to bow our heads. Everyone bowing your head for a moment. Just as there was an invitation given by Jesus here in chapter 22, I would like to do the same thing, follow in his steps. With heads bowed, eyes closed, would there be someone today who would say, Pastor, today is the day when I want to say yes to the invitation that Christ gives. I want him to be my Lord. I want to settle my eternal destiny. No one looking around. Would you just simply raise your hand and say, Pastor, pray for me. I want to settle the whole issue of my soul with God. No one's looking. Would you just simply hold your hand up just a moment so we could pray with you. God bless. Father God, as we come to this holy moment, I pray that everyone here has made that decision. I pray that no one will put it off. I pray that everyone is looking for your return and is looking forward to being in that wonderful new Jerusalem with you. Thank you for preparing such a place. Thank you for the sweet and precious promises. And we ask all of this in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. While you're remaining standing, I'm going to ask our servers if they would to come forward. We're going to have a server over here at this station. We have a station right down at the front and we have a station over here. I'm going to be asking that the, uh, the folks in these two seating sessions back there, the two seating sections, that you all just file out your left come down to the front, pick up the elements, and then file back in on the right side of the, the there and have your uh, communion there. And here's the thing. This is a time of self-examination. So what I want you to do is when you're ready, when you're standing there and you are ready, then you partake. I will invite us all to partake in a moment but whenever you're ready this is between you and God doing spiritual business you will want to peel back the, the bread part first and then peel back the juice part 
So that's, uh, that's the way we're going to do it. This section here and this section here come down here to this here and this little short section right here if you will come this way. And then these three sections back here if you will come over here where Glenn is and just pick up your element and then just go right back to your seat. So everybody will go out to your left, get the elements, come back in and file back in on the right. All right? So if you would, make your way forward. Let's come now. he was with his disciples took the bread and broke it and he said take eat this is my body that was broken for you and then he said this cup take and drink for this is my blood it was shed for the new covenant folks the broken body the shed blood. These will be reminders not only here on earth, but they will be reminders in heaven. This is something the Lord values. He said, do this 
in remembrance of me. And in eternity, we will still be doing this in remembrance of him. Let us partake.